Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Maysville this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. And if you would, please take just a moment to fill out the blue visitor's cards. Those are on the back of the pew in front of you. We'll have the ushers come around and pick those up in just a moment. We're a little bit light in our number today. Most of the church is up in uh, Nashville attending Lads to Leaders, um, so it's not always this thin, so you got a good seat today. The, uh, they'll be back this evening. On the sick list, continue to remember Totsie Sanders and David Robinson. The prime timers are planning a fun food and fellowship night. This will be Tuesday night at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Please bring a covered dish, drinks, dessert, and your favorite game for that activity. There's also going to be a bridal tea for Jessica Deaton and Vince Andrews on Sunday, April 22nd from 2 to 4 o'clock in the fellowship hall. They're going to be married Friday, May 11th, and they are registered at Bed Bath & Beyond and Target. Continue to remember our gospel meeting that's coming up in about four weeks. Brother Jim Dearman will be speaking. That's going to be Sunday, May 6th through May 9th. So start inviting people to that now. Also, there will be a gospel meeting in Stevenson. That's April 15th through 19th. And the speaker is going to be Brother Tim Rice. Our opening song this morning is number 501. 501. Our closing prayer will be led by Brian Norris. Our lesson this morning by Lonnie Jones. We'll start this morning with a prayer by Steve Watson. Would you bow as we go to God in prayer? Our gracious Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for this time that we can come before you. And we know, Father, that you are all-knowing and all-powerful and ever-present, and that you know our every need even before we ask it. We thank you, Father, for loving us and for providing for us, for caring for us, and for all that you do. And we know, Father, that Every good gift comes down from your hand. And help us, Father, to be ever mindful of the good things that you've done for each one of us. We pray now, Father, that you will bless us as we enter into worship of you. That we will give you the things that you require of us. That our, spirit, that our worship will be in spirit and in truth. We're mindful, Father, of those who are sick and undergoing various difficulties in their lives and we pray father that your richest blessings be upon them we're especially mindful this morning of brother totsy and david robinson we pray that you will bless these and help return them to their normal states of health and we thank you father for others that have undergone surgeries and that are doing better and even here today we pray father that you will be with the missionaries and and those that are proclaiming your word throughout this world we pray that the doors will be open that the borders of your kingdom will be increased we also pray father that you will be with us as we live our everyday lives that we will always be consistent and that we will do the things that will be bring glory and honor to your name and not to us. We pray, Father, that you will be with those that are away this morning, that you will provide them with a safe trip back home. Pray that you will continue, Father, to be with us through this day. Pray that you will forgive us of our sins as we repent and turn from those things and to live our lives in such a way that one day we will hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Number 501. Like Brother Greg mentioned, we have a large number of our congregation that's missing this morning, so sing out extra loudly and enthusiastically. Oh, worship the King, all glory us above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, a pavilion in splendor, and curtain with praise, Thy bounty. It breathes in the air 
supper this morning, we'll sing number 440, number 440. We'll sing the first and second verses. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so for, so grateful for this time that we have each Sunday to to remember your son and the sacrifice that he made in our place. We're so grateful for his life and his dedication and his obedience to your will. We're so grateful that he is our Savior. We pray that as we take this bread that we may remember him and remember our, our own lives and and see if we're following his example. Help us to take in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.
you bow with me, please? Father, we continue our thanks to Thee for this fruit of the vine. As we think back to the cross and how Christ's blood was poured out that we might have forgiveness of sins and understand the hope of life eternal. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, that we'll think the extreme sacrifice which he made for us, that it took the last drop of his blood, that we might be able to become children of God and and be able to serve and be your children. Help us now as we partake, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We have an opportunity to give back a portion of uh, the blessings that we've been given. Uh, We'll be reminded about the, the true source of those blessings originally as we sing this next song, number 184, number 184. Sing the first and second verses. God is the fountain winds ten thousand plans sing slow to
Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to praise you now for all that you have done and are doing in our lives. And Father, from the beginning, your plan has been to give us the things that, that we need and not the things that we deserve. And Father, every day you fulfill our needs. Every day you give us abilities to work with our hands and our minds to provide a living for our families. And Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to, to work. I'm so, op- I'm so grateful for this opportunity to give back what is already yours. We pray, Father, as we do this, as we give back now, we, we do so in a cheerful manner. And that this money will be used to further your kingdom and that souls will be won for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a convenient time for you to mark our invitation song. It'll be number 65. Number 65. The song we'll sing after the lesson this morning. After you've marked that one, please turn to hymn number 238. Number 238. I'll ask if you're able to, please stand as we sing this song. Holy, holy, holy.
thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee. Perfect in power and love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Please be seated. We've already tried to express our appreciation for your attendance. I want you to know that we're happy that you chose to come out and to worship with us. It's uh, already been mentioned that a large contingent of our folks are in Nashville. We, we participate in a program called Lads to Leaders. It was originally started by a gentleman named Jack Zorn and wanted to turn lads into leaders. Interestingly enough, uh, Brother Zorn had three daughters. He had no lads to become leaders. And I went to church with Jack and with Sonia and, and Risa and Rhonda when I was a boy. And uh, the girls said, Daddy, you're spending all this time with the boys. What about us? So he expanded it to be lasses to leaderettes. Now, very often... We confused the two names and talked about lads to leaderettes. We don't want our lads becoming leaderettes. But the program basically takes young people and trains them in several different skill areas. Public speaking, song leading, public prayer, debate, art, mass media, service projects, Bible bowl, memorization of Scripture. And our folks usually start that preparation in September, October, and those preparations culminate uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And we've got a large group of our young people and adults who've worked very hard for this weekend. And so that's where a lot of our folks are. I haven't heard yet uh, about any specific number that we took with us. I think it's usually in the hundreds. And then I don't know how our, our young people fared in their various uh, presentations. But uh, they'll be back tonight and you'll probably get a chance to hear the young men speak that were in Nashville. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to... Uh, the Gospel of John. I didn't go to Nashville um, for two reasons. One is I had to work yesterday and uh, on the ropes course, had a, a really impressive group of young men come spend the day with us on our challenge course and then Tim coaches our debate group and so he likes to be with them for the weekend and so since he's going to be gone I'll stay here and, and preach in the Sunday morning service uh, so since I didn't have anything to do Friday night I got invited uh, to go fishing with some guys and this this gentleman I'm not sure I want to use the term but he he has a bow fishing ministry now, I'm not sure that, that that doesn't border on cult. I'm not, I'm not real sure. He's got this massive pontoon boat that he's customized to be a fishing rig. Uh, he's got three pontoons under it. If you know anything about boats, with 1,800 pounds in the boat, he only draws nine inches of water. So he can take that boat into places that, that you probably couldn't even walk. And uh, he starts in early April, and he'll shoot every weekend until the water temperature disappears and the fish quit spawning. Uh, I've been with him several, several times. Uh, the last time, not this Friday, but the last time I went with him, we put 600 pounds of fish in the boat. I killed two monster gar. Uh, but what he does is he usually invites young people, two or three kids, a dad and a daughter, uh, whatever, and then he tries to have at least one minister in the boat. Uh, Kyle Butt, who uh, writes for Apologetics Press, 
uh, I've got to fish with Kyle, and he uses it as a chance to, to influence people. I don't know how many kids he's baptized from that boat, but he's baptized several. Uh, I was fishing with some guys one night, and of course, you're out on the river all night, and you're floating around, and, and uh, you talk about some really interesting stuff. Well, he invited me to go Friday night. He said he teaches auto mechanics uh, at a trade school. He's, he's also a uh, mechanic for the city of Florence. He said, I got these three guys going to be on the boat. They don't go to church. They're not Christians. I want you to go with us just so I'll have some, some ability to influence these guys. So we get out on the river, and we're, we're putting across, getting into the area that we want to fish. And one of the young men is just fascinated by the moon. Oh, he said, man, I've never seen the moon this big. I've never seen the moon when it was this dark. I've never seen the moon over water. I mean, he was just hung up with the moon. And, and as, as, as we talked, I just mentioned the moon's full this time of year because it's Passover. I said, Passover was the Jewish feast that was held every year, and it was set up, I believe, purposely by God to fall on a full moon. And the weekend Jesus was crucified was on a Passover weekend. In fact, when Jesus was crucified, Passover fell on the Sabbath day. And we're out on the water. You can't hear anything but the boat noise. The air was absolutely still. You got this big full moon hanging up over the water. Jesus, and I told these young men, Jesus would have had supper with his disciples. They would have met in an upper room and they would have done a, a celebration meal. It, it, would, it would be like today if you're gathering with a large group of folks for an Easter meal. Business as usual. It's Easter. We always do this on Easter. Well, it's Passover, and these guys would always get together and always do this traditional Jewish feast. And it's just a bunch of men together. So there's there, there's probably not the, the typical kind of thing going on. At the Passover meal, the youngest person at the table would have to ask the question, why do we eat these bitter herbs? Why is there no leaven in the bread? So, you, so you've got these guys and the youngest guy at the table, and I, and I want to think it was John, would have to be the part of the youngest kid. He'd have to ask the traditional questions. And I can't imagine them not having a traditional Passover meal. But, but they're going to eat the Passover. And while they're eating the Passover, Jesus says, I want you to take some of this unleavened bread. I want you to break it. And from now on, Every time you eat this kind of bread, it represents my body. See, Jesus knows what's coming. These guys don't. And then he takes the traditional wine cup and, and he, he divides it and he gives it to them. And he says, and when you drink this, this dark red wine, it represents my blood of a new covenant. And when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're going to think about my death. Well, they talk for a little while, and then they get up from the table and they go out to the Mount of Olives. To, to leave the city of Jerusalem, you've got to go to the eastern side of the temple, and there's a little trail that goes down. It goes into the Kidron Valley. It goes down and probably up another 500 feet onto the Mount of Olives, and on the Mount of Olives is, is a garden called Gethsemane, called the Olive Press. When you walk out of the temple compound there to go across into the uh, Mount of Olives, you've got to cross a little brook called the Kidron. And the Kidron is, is, is basically a little stream that kind of runs through the place. It flowed or at least had part of an, an aqueduct that would have attached from the temple and flowed out. You've got a million Jews in Jerusalem for Passover. And on this very night, in, in, in Mark chapter 14, it, it says, this is the night when it was traditional to sacrifice the Passover lamb. The priests are in the temple killing the lambs for Passover. And you've got to do something with all that blood. And they're probably draining it into the Kidron. And it's flowing in that little creek and down the side of the valley. And as Jesus and his disciples walk out under that full moon... 
they probably crossed a blood red creek. They go up into this little garden. The weather's warm. It's springtime in Jerusalem. And they're just going to be out there under the stars. Jesus says, you guys wait here. I'm going to go pray. If you're reading the Old Testament, when Absalom rebelled against David and he attacks the palace, David leaves the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says that he left the city up the ascent of the Mount of Olives. Now, folks, that's the same trail that Jesus is on. David goes up the ascent of the Mount of Olives because it gives him high ground over Jerusalem. And if you're standing on the Mount of Olives and somebody comes out of the city of Jerusalem in the dark with a light, you can see them. You can see them forever. You stand there on the, the edge of that little hill and defend that high ground because you've you got to go around it and then there's an 1,800-foot ascent if you go up from, from the path coming into Jericho. So David went out by the, the ascent of the Mount of Olives and he's in a superior position. He's on the military crest and anybody coming out of Jerusalem to follow him, he, he, he can defend this. David, David did it for tactical reasons. Jesus is there. He's praying and I believe he can see the city of Jerusalem. When those guys leave the temple and, and the Bible says they had lanterns and they had torches, you had a small group of men who were kind of like your, your temple guards, probably in all the commotion to come out and arrest Jesus. Some Roman soldiers got involved because John will tell us that there was a, a, a part of a Roman cohort that was with them. Jesus is sitting here in the garden. He knows he's about to be crucified. His disciples are asleep, and while he's there in the garden praying, he can see the city of Jerusalem. He can see that line of torches come out and cross the Kidron and down the valley and start up. And what was a beautiful, traditional Passover weekend suddenly becomes chaos. Jesus is in the garden. His disciples are there. This group of armed men rush in. There's a, a, a slight commotion. They bind Jesus. And they lead him away. Now, if you're one of those disciples, you, your world has been changed. Now, these guys have seen Jesus calm a storm. These guys have seen Jesus stand in the face of a demon-possessed man and say, leave. And the demon leave and the man remain. They seen Jesus stand in front of a sealed tomb and say, roll the stone back. And heard him simply say, Lazarus, come out. And a dead man, been dead three days, walks out of that tomb. For them to stand and watch Jesus be bound helpless and hauled away makes their world turn on a, on a different axis it's it's unbelievable in, in, in fact it, it's so unbelievable that Peter will deny knowing Jesus when he's standing in the courtyard warming his hands and he's watching them interview Jesus and sees Jesus not this 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 powerful messianic figure but standing there and then they probably can't hear the exchange that's going on but they see this guy just open hand slap Jesus and nothing happens and then somebody says don't you know this guy and Peter says I don't, I, I don't know him and later on somebody says you, you know this guy and I, I don't know him folks Peter within 16 hours of this event has stood in front of the disciples and told Jesus, I'll die for you. And now he said, I, I don't even know him. And it's nothing unusual for Jesus and the Jewish leadership to be at controversy. But all of a sudden they involve the Romans. Romans. And they leave Annas and Caiaphas and, and they leave the Sanhedrin and they go to Pilate. And Pilate sends him to Herod. 
And here it sends him back to Pilate. And by 9 a.m. the next day, they have sentenced him to die. And the apostles that followed him and the apostles that invested their lives, they walked away from everything to follow this guy that they thought was going to redeem Israel. Now, some of them had some military concepts in mind. And, 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 but by 9 a.m. the next morning, he's being nailed to a Roman cross and stood up. And for six hours, he hangs there suffocating to death because when you die from crucifixion it's it's not because of the trauma or the blood loss you suffocate you stretch your arms out at a bad angle and pull and your rib cage can't expand and when your rib cage doesn't expand your diaphragm can't move and so for 6 hours he had to hang with nails through his wrist and nails through his ankles and push and pull just to breathe and he did it for 6 hours They're walking by the prisoners because the next day is a, a holy day for the Jews. And they say, hey, tell those Romans we've got to clean these bodies up. We can't have them displayed like this for Passover. So in order to facilitate their death, the Romans walk by and, and, and break their legs so they can't push anymore. But when they get to Jesus, his legs don't have to be broken because he's already dead. And I don't know if we even understand how cruel the Roman military could be, but it's just a piece of meat hanging on that cross, so he just takes his spear and jabs it under the ribs, and blood and water pour out. They walk off. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea approach Pilate and say, We'd like to claim a body. And they loosely wrap it in spices and linen cloth because... It's the day before a Passover celebration, and if it gets dark, you can't do any work. So they're going to violate the Passover if, if they do. So they hastily prepare Jesus' body and put him in a tomb, and they leave. The Jews go to Pilate, and they say, Now this guy was a troublemaker. This guy caused all kinds of trouble, and he even told his disciples that he's going to raise from the dead. Let's make sure there's no shenanigans. Let's make sure nothing goes on here. We want you to give us some soldiers to seal this tomb. And Pilate says, you got your men. And a small group, a detachment of Roman soldiers, put the iron eagle of Rome on this tomb. We see a police line that says, do not cross. It's way more authoritative than that for us. This is the Iron Eagle of Rome. It says, you don't touch this tomb. And those guys stand there and stand guard. Sometime just before daylight, and we don't know the details, something happened. The scholars who write about it say not just that this stone was rolled away. And, and those stones work like this. You, you, you carve out a big round ceiling stone and you, you carve into the little alcove of a cave and the stone set in like a little trench and it would have a stopper stone in front of it. When it came time to seal it, you just put a little pressure on that stone and move that chalk and it rolls in front of the door and it's done. It'd take about 20 men to move this stone out of the way is what the estimates are. The people who've written about this in detail say that, that whatever happened between dark and daylight, the stone wasn't rolled away. The stone was blown out of the trench. It was lying outside. The Roman soldiers fainted. And I don't know what that means to you. Roman soldiers saw something that was so amazing, so frightening that they entered into a catatonic state and passed out. Roman soldiers don't faint. It would be like us saying that, that we took a group of our Navy SEALs or a bunch of Delta operators and, and, and something happened to them that, that, that they fainted. And then the tomb's empty. The women come back to the tomb on early Sunday morning because... They couldn't do the proper preparations because they didn't want to violate the Sabbath. So, so they come to the tomb. When they come to the tomb, it is, it is empty. 
And they go back and they tell the disciples, and Peter and John run to the tomb, and, and John will be quick to say that in, in his gospel, and, and I outran Peter. But when John gets to the tomb, he stops, and Peter goes in. And not only is the tomb empty, but the, the burial clothes are laying there, and the, the napkin that would cover the face is, is folded. And so now you go from, I can't believe they's, they've arrested Jesus, and I can't believe Jesus is dead, to what happened? And then the rumors fly. He's, he's been resurrected. The, the soldiers are paid to say that his disciples came in and overpowered them. <laughs> the soldiers. Roman soldiers say a group of fishermen... You've got to understand the military might of these guys. When they're trying to arrest Jesus, Peter tries to cut a guy's head off and all he gets is an ear. And the guy Peter attacked was the servant to the high priest. Read that as youth intern, okay? He didn't even attack the real man in the group. He jumped on some college kid that was interning. And then these soldiers want us to believe that this group of ragtag disciples who only had two swords come in and overpower them, move this stone and steal a body. And by the way, if you steal the body, how come you left the burial clothes there? John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Hey, these guys aren't body snatchers. They're hiding they, they don't have anything to do with the Romans. They're not going to touch the Roman soldiers. They really have, have no issue with being aggressive right now. They're just in hiding. They're hiding with the doors locked because they're afraid. Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Afterwards, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And then again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, and Didymus simply means the twin. Now, Thomas the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's a real interesting exchange between Thomas and his brothers. Thomas said, you know, I, I heard this talk about Messiah. And I saw some things I couldn't make peace with as far as storms and demons and dead people and feeding 5,000. And He said, you know what, fellas? Unless I put my finger in that hole... Unless I stick my hand in his side, I don't believe you. In fact, what he says in Greek, the, the Greek word for belief is pistes. And he says, ume pistes. It's a Greek double negative. He says, I will not ever believe. I'm done. I, I didn't think he could be arrested. I, I didn't think he could be murdered. Not me, fellas. Not this time. I'm finished. And unless I put my finger in the wound, I don't believe in him. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, now depending on the translation you have, you'll have 
put your finger here or place your finger. In Greek, literally, if you translate it, and I had to do the whole book for Dr. Walters in college, literally what it translates in Greek is, Thomas, bring your finger here. Bring your finger here. See my hands? Reach out and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas declares, My Lord and my God. Thomas has drawn a line in the sand. You know what? I, this ain't happening to me again. I'm not being fooled. You're not going to. I was there. I saw. No. And if you expect me to sign up for this again, if you expect me to even be a part, I, Thomas not even coming to their meetings. They're together and he's not there. They run into him later and say, we've seen, the <laughs> not me, fellas. I, I'm done with that. Well, for whatever reason, a week later, he's with them. And sometimes I infer that this was on a Sunday. And so they're probably together Remembering his death, I don't know if they're taking the Lord's Supper or not, but they gathered together, and that seemed like on the first day of the week rather than on Sabbath. And Thomas is there, and all of a sudden the doors are closed, and Jesus is standing there and says, Thomas, get, let me see your finger. And put your finger in the nail prints, and put your hand in my side. And Thomas, stop disbelieving and start believing. And, and Thomas declares this my Lord and my God. And he's, he's not saying my God like, like the kids do on Facebook or on the instant messages. He is claiming personal ownership not only of Jesus as his master, but Jesus as deity. Thomas has made the switch from you could be the Messiah to not only are you the Son of God, but you are God. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus says to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What do you believe in? My grandmother, who died... at age 89 or 90 believed that professional wrestling was authentic but she did not believe a man had walked on the moon what what do you believe my grandmother said I've seen those guys at the civic center I ain't never seen those footprints on that moon <laughs> Jesus says something very interesting to Thomas. He goes, Thomas, you got the show and tell. Because you have seen, you believed. Blessed, and that's a real interesting word. It doesn't just mean happy. It means having a, an ability to be centered in life. The people who are, are truly going to have a centering a peace about them in life. Pe people who can look at anything that's going on and not be troubled by it. Those folks are those who have not seen yet believe. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the Hebrew writer describes faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not believed, of things not seen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, how can you have evidence for something you haven't seen? See, if there's something that you haven't seen, yet you believe it is evidentiary, your faith becomes the evidence in and of itself. I don't know that I can illustrate that for you.
when we were boys, my brother was influenced by a man that I consider to be one of the most effective communicators on the planet. An incredible scholar, an incredible teacher, and my brother got to work closely with him. My brother, in fact, worked as a youth minister at a church without a salary just to be able to be associated with this man. Early in our development, he began to have the conversation with my brother that in the coming years, now this is you know back in the late 70s, early 80s, that in the coming years, the most educated person in, in, in the congregation was not going to be the minister. Used to, you know, you, you go to the, the, the old small churches out in rural Arkansas and rural Tennessee, and, and the minister was the only guy there that had a degree. He said, in, in the next few years, the church is going to change, and then there are going to be people with doctorates and master's degrees and professional degrees, and the minister is not going to be the most educated person in the congregation. And if you want to be an effective minister, you've got to have better education. And as they talked, Gerald said, well, obviously what you're saying is where I'm attending school is not where I need to be attending school. I need to go somewhere else. And he said, exactly right. My brother, the first person he called was me. I was still in high school. Had scored enough on my ACT to have a full ride at Jacksonville State University. Go get to go to college not pay anybody any money. That's pretty cool. My brother said, if you are going to go to college... This is where you need to go, and this is why you need to go there, because this is what Joe said. On the advice of those two men, and those two men alone, I went out to Arkansas for college. Now, they were right. That's where I needed to be. Everything about what I'm able to do in life is because of that step. Several years later, I'm sitting in an audience, and this man is, is teaching. And he's teaching on faith. And, and he's talking, and he's very articulate, and he uses his hands a lot. And just randomly, just out of the blue, he says, oh, and by the way, I have a $100 bill in my hand. Oh, that's random. But he's standing there in front of this audience, a couple hundred people there. He says, I've got a $100 bill in my hand. How many of you believe me? Well, I'm watching his hands all day. He didn't have a $100 bill in his hand. He said, on my honor. And that's a big word with me, honor. He said, on my honor, as a Christian gentleman, I have a hundred dollar bill in my hand. Who believes me? And at 22 years old, I stood up. I know what he meant to Gerald. I know what he meant to me. And he used two words, honor and Christian. When he dropped those two words, he said, I got a $100 bill in my hand. Do you believe me? I stood up. He said, have you seen it? I said, no, sir. He said, would you testify in court that I had it? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you prove it? I said, no. He said, then how do you know? I said, I don't know, but I believe based on your honor and your reputation. I believe Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And he gives this exchange that if he puts his hands in his pocket and then brings them back out, you don't know whether he did a magic trick or not. He makes it that, it, that, that once, you, once his hand leaves our ability to look at it, that I'll have to go away and be willing to answer the question the rest of my life, did he or did he not have $100 in his hand? And as he continued to talk, and I continued to stand, he opened up his hand and tucked inside his ring 
folded very, very small, he pulls out a little piece of paper and begins to unfold it. And he had a hundred dollar bill. Had had it the whole time. I'm not saying that that, that is an example of the level of faith you've got to have. It, it, your faith needs to be much more. That's a cheap, cheesy example. God says, do you believe in me? Yes, sir. Can you prove it? No. Would you testify that I'm real? Yes. Have you seen it? No. Would you be willing to take a stand on the fact that God is real and the Bible is true and that Jesus is resurrected. Now once you say that you believe that, blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe, and faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And if you're struggling with Christianity, and if the things we do here are more ritual than relationship, It's because you're not like those people beside Thomas. See, Jesus said, Thomas, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You've seen and you believe. Good job. Jesus said, what I'm interested in are those people who have not seen yet believe. I'm interested in those people who say, I've never touched the nail prints. I've never put my hand in his side. I didn't see the cross. I've never even been to Jerusalem. But I believe. And when asked if I'm willing to stand up for what I believe in, will I take that stand even if I have to die never being able to prove it? And the message this morning is not whether or not Jesus rose. But the message this morning is whether or not you believe it. And the message this morning is not just do you believe it, but does that affect the way you make choices? Does that affect the way you live? Does that affect the way you work? Does that affect the way you parent? Does that affect the way you get along with your spouse? Does that affect everything? Why are you doing it that way? Because Jesus said to. Do you really believe in Jesus? Well, yes, I do. Why? Because that's what he said, and because of what he said, I'm going to stand. Well, I can tell very clearly whether you believe or not by what you do. I can know very clearly or not by how pure your life is, by what you watch on TV, by what you listen to in your music, by how you conduct yourselves with members of the opposite sex, by how much self-control you have. See, there are people who say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe. But when it comes time to stand up and prove it, most of us are sitting down. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Do you believe? that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He rose from the dead. And if you believe that, th th there's only one action people who believe can take, and that is to say, I compare my life to what you say my life should be, and, and I'm willing to change that. And once you make that change, you've got to be willing to confess in every situation, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And once you believe and once you're willing to modify your life, we call that repentance, and once you're willing to make that confession, then who you used to be is over. That person needs to die. And we bury them in water. And just as Christ rose from the dead, they rise to walk a new life. If you really believe in Jesus, why haven't you been baptized? And if you've been baptized, why aren't you living like He asked you to live? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Why don't you prove what you believe about Jesus by responding to this message today while we stand and while we sing? Oh. Uh -huh.
Thank you, Brother Lonnie, for that message. In closing, we'll sing hymn number 267. Number 267. I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he still Galilee. I believe that he walked on the water. And I believe that he's the Father, we came to you as enemies, and you gave us peace. We came to you as sinners, and you gave us forgiveness. We came to you as strangers, and you gave us a place in your family. We deserve death, and you gave us life. We deserve punishment, and you gave us a pardon. We cannot express in words the gratitude for what you've done for us. Pray that our words and our actions in this world will show some token of our gratitude towards you. We thank you for the reminder that we've had this morning of what's been done for us. and We thank you for your son and his willingness to give for us. Father, be with us as we go forward. Keep us safe and Have our faith grow for all the days that you give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.